Welcome. Uh, John Marr is my name and I'm part of the Grass 10 team. So this morning we're going to talk to you about uh, grazing management for the next few months and look it has been a very difficult start to year as everyone knows. However, uh, from a grass production perspective it's still good news because most of the grass is still to be grown for the year. So for the next few minutes I want to talk to you a little bit about the uh, grazing management, a little bit about slurry and fertilizer application because we are running a small bit behind. However, just to outline here on the presentation, um, you can see that 80% of the grass uh, to be grown for the year will occur from early May on. So we still have a, a lot of the grass grown year to happen. And I suppose the other piece to, to add to this is that that's what we call an, an, a normal um, you know, grass growing farm. Un unfortunately, some people have to work on much heavier land. And I work in the heavy soils program, and, and we know from um, that program that people on heavier land that 90% of the grass is still to be grown for the, from early May on, simply because it has been you know a late year and late turnout um, has happened. So there's still a lot of grass to be grown. That's the key point. And if we look at the, the pasture based Ireland data for the last number of years, we see the average growth rate across the next four months is 65 kilograms of dry matter per hectare per day. Now that's a vital figure because it tells us that we can stock the farm uh, quite well, and it also tells us about the grass that we enter into. I'll come back to that a little bit later. But just to be, put the thing in perspective, I suppose, you know, we will grow roughly 70 plus during the month of May, somewhere in the high 60s in the middle, uh, or, you know, in the month of June, probably the mid 60s in July, and the, the low 60s in, in, in August. But for the next four months, we can actually grow an awful lot of grass, right? Now, in terms of managing that grass, you know, the growth is one, one point. To manage it is, is another um, equally important point. And we talk about rotation length. And specifically, we talk about somewhere about 18, 19, 20 days, maybe 21 days. Now, that corresponds to two very, very important things. The first thing is that, you know, the ryegrass plant, which is the grass we're after, right, um, every seven days a, a leaf appears. So we know from that plant that when the fourth leaf appears, right, that the first leaf dies and we get more stem. So that's why we target rotation length of roughly 18 to 20 days. So we have the grass, ripe grass plant at the two and a half to three leaf stage. That's why the rotation length is, is around that day because a, a leaf, as I, as I said earlier, appears every seven days, two leaves after 14 days, and the third leaf uh, appears around 21 days. So if we go to, if we go to the fourth leaf, the first one will die and more stem will come. That means the animal's diet is compromised because they're eating stem and dead, and dead material, which means that they won't perform as well. The other reason why the 18 to 20 days is important is if we take 20 days multiplied by the 65 growth rate per, per day, that gives us an average uh, you know, yield of grass before we enter somewhere around the 13 to 1400 mark, which corresponds to two and a half to three leaf phase of the grass plant. Right, so we try to enter fourteen hundred kilograms of grass to matter per hectare, right, and that corresponds, as I said earlier, to the sixty-five multiplied by the twenty days, or during the month of May, seventy by twenty days, right. This allows us to stock the the herd or the flock at somewhere around four livestock units per hectare on the grazing area, and the reason I say that is if we multiply four by sixteen, which is the average demand of a suckler cow and calf or a dairy cow or some of the heavier um, animals, right? Four by 15, four by 16, 16 multiplied, that, that sum is cor corresponds to 65 kilograms of dry matter per hectare per day. So basically the amount of grass we grow roughly equals to demand. Now this depends a little bit on land type and we understand that, right? And you know, on heavier land, we may not be able to stock quite as, as high as four livestock units per hectare, but it just gives you an idea of what can be done. And in a year where the cupboard is bare in terms of silage, Stocking that a little bit higher allows us to dedicate more area for far um, silage making. Equally, if growth rate is higher than the 65 or 70, we can turn that surplus grass into round bales, which you know will go a long way to try and build up silage reserves for the year ahead. The other point that's not mentioned um, on the board, but that are on the slide, but is important is when we enter the grass at the right stage, effectively effectively we grow more grass. When, we, when the fourth leaf appears, we lose grass production, right? We grow less. The other point to know is 
we tend to also then when the grass quality goes poor, we tend to top. Now you have to ask yourself the question, like if I'm continuously topping, right, am I wasting feed? Should that feed be in a round bale? Okay. So, you know, we all understand that things go wrong in terms of weather. We might have to top the odd paddock. But equally, if we're continuously topping all the time, maybe we're, we're, we're just a bit too conservative. Maybe we should skip that paddock and be turned, or that field, and turn it into round bales to make solids for next winter. Now, this can only really happen if you keep an eye on what's happening on the farm, right? And that's why we, the, the, the second last point here says walk the farm weekly. And it doesn't have to be just put measurement on it, right? Obviously, we prefer measurement to happen, but just by walking the farm, we'll give you a picture of what's happening on the farm. So you go to a paddock and you say, okay, I'm a week away from this, but maybe that paddock is only um, actually two days away in terms of the grass that's on it. And you say to yourself, God, this place will be gone wild in a week. And maybe that paddock then should be cut out for surplus um, uh, silage and, and instead of being um, grazed and being topped afterwards and, and wasting feed. For those who measure and use Pasture Base Ireland, you know, we try to get people to operate around 160 to 180 kilograms per livestock unit, or basically 10 days of, of grass a head. Right? Now, just when I mention Pasture Base Ireland, obviously people have, 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 have inquired to us about um, the development of an app, and we know that's coming sometime by early June, hopefully. Right? So just in summary then in this slide for grazing for the next um, uh, few months, right, and particularly the next 60 days, Growth rate is at its highest at this time of year. Try and keep the rotation length short because the growth rate is high. Try and um, uh, avoid grazing very strong grass and put it into, the, into bales um, or into the silage pit so we have silage for next winter. And try to enter that, you know, 1,400 kilograms of grass per, per, per hectare, which is the, the right stage of grass in terms of having two and a half to three leaves of the ryegrass plant and avoid going to the fourth leaf, which means we get a more stem and deterioration in quality. And the only way to do this really is to keep an eye on the farm, which means walking the farm. So that's the grazing targets. Now we have to try and keep this grass growing as well, right? In a, in a year, I suppose, uh, I suppose, especially when um, the cupboard is bare. And in order to improve grass supply and maximize growth, we have to get our best response from our fertilizer and slurry, right? And it's been a difficult year because a lot of fertilizer applications have been behind. behind. And in a lot of cases, slurry hasn't got out um, onto, onto grass at all in the spring, simply because the weather was so difficult. So we're a little bit behind on those um, tasks. So if I start with the fertilizer first, right? And in terms of nitrogen fertilizer, fertilizer, just a rough guide is one unit of nitrogen per day in the rotation. So if I'm operation, operating a 20-day rotation, that means that I'll be applying, you know, about 30 units per month, right? So 20-day rotation plus the 10 days are left, which is a rotation and a half. Multiply that's 30 days by, um, by one unit per day is roughly around 30, 30 units. Okay, so that's the nitrogen story. Um, that also depends on how much nitrogen has been applied during April as well. But look to try and get back on track if we can apply 30 units per rotation, that wouldn't be a bad start. All right, uh, per month, sorry, yeah, um, one unit per day in the rotation. Equally, then we have to be more conscious of what's happening there in terms of environmental practices, both domestic and industrial. And what I mean by this is there's a lot less uh, pollutants in the atmosphere. And I suppose by default, then there's a lot less atmospheric sulfur around. Therefore, we, we see now over time greater responses to sulfur, sulfur application, particularly in drier years and, and particularly on, on drier farms. But I, I've actually seen sulfur responses even on heavy farms as well. And the, the, there's kind of three main forms of sulfur there, thereabouts that most people will use, which is uh, a product ASN, which I'll come back to, um, which is 26% uh, nitrogen and 14% uh, sulfur. But equally, we can use you know the, the CAN plus S strategy or urea plus S strategy. Now, there are compound fertilizers with, with sulfur as well. I'll come back to that. But just to start with the ASN is, a, is a, a kind of a one application strategy. If I apply a bag, bag and a half of ASN, I have all my sulfur requirements uh, achieved for the year. However, it's a, it's a, it's a once-off application really. And some people are a little bit nervous about sulfur at times, so they prefer to, to try, for, prefer to apply a little and often, which means they apply CAN plus S or urea plus S, which has about you know, three or four units of sulfur in it. The bottom line here is that we try to get 15 to 20 units of sulfur out be before the 1st of July. That's what we're trying to do. Okay? So if you want to do the sulfur 
uh, application you really want to start now or have started in April to try and get, you know, that I want to sulfur out. Equally, sulfur is also important for silage ground. And we say roughly 10 units per cut, 10 units for first cut, 10 units for second cut. Now, you can apply that uh, in the form of fertilizer or just to be clear, like there is sulfur and slurry as well. Now, the other point about fertilizer application here, I suppose, is it's been a very difficult spring. It's been a difficult autumn. The grass plant has gone through a difficult time in terms of grazing, a difficult time in terms of growing. So in many cases, it's, it's in what I would call recovery or repair mode. And the best uh, piece of fertilizer or nutrient for the repair and recovery process is phosphorus. And that's why we recommend, you know, 18612 plus sulfur um, as a kind of a universal product to apply sulfur, to apply nitrogen, to get some level of K out there, but in particular phosphorus. And phosphorus is necessary for early season growth, and that's been behind, right? It's also necessary for uh, the, the ryegrass plant to survive, right? So, um, and to get the best use to, out of our fertilizers as well, we also need phosphorus. So um, many farmers who are serious about grazing need to consider a compound, particularly where soil fertility is poor. So 18, 6, 12 of application, a bag and a half um, to two bags on dairy farms, maybe a little less so on, on, on uh, dry stock farms, but certainly a bag on dry stock farms wouldn't go astray because the biggest harvester of phosphorus is the milk or meat that goes out the gate, and that has to be replaced, right? Some people tell you that, or consider that, if I apply slurry back on the land, I'm applying surf, um, um, sul uh, sulfur and, and uh, uh, pea, you are. However, you're not replacing the phosphorus that went out the gate. Okay. Speaking of slurry, look, it has been a difficult spring. Um, it, animals have been housed longer than normal. A lot of tanks are full or almost full. Um, we're now full-time grazing. Silage ground, is, uh, a lot of it is closed. So there's tanks now with, with slurry in them and a lot more than, than previous years. So when we cut the, um, the silage ground sometime in late May, uh, uh, first half of June, right, we should try and get um, the slurry back out there onto that area. Right? This is to replace the P and K that's been harvested by the crop to help improve soil fertility. And for those like who um, uh, are in trouble with, with, with uh, derogation and regulation, like you know, the, the, the law changes or the regulations change after the 1st of July, in which we apply a uh, slurry a bit differently with um, you know, um, low emission spreading uh, machinery. So there is a chance to get slurry out on the first cut area um, um, after silage is harvested. And this will replenish a lot of the nutrients, particularly P and K, Obviously, the, the, the amount of nitrogen will be, will be a little bit lower because of the time of year, but it is a chance to get slurry out instead of trying to carry it into the back end or carry it across the summer, right? And it's, been, it's proven difficult with the, way, with, with the way the weather patterns have been coming, the way demand for contractors and the way our grazing management um, systems operate to try and get slurry out in the back end. So slurry should be targeted at the front end of the season when there's an, an opportunity there between... Um, spring, which was difficult this year, but look, we still have um, the silage areas, be it first cut, second cut, or even after bales, um, to apply some slurry. Right? So to, to improve the grass supply and maximise growth, we have to make best use of the slurry that's there, and in terms of fertiliser, we need to consider nitrogen, some sulphur, and, and peas and caves. So the one product that does all that to a large degree is a compound fertiliser like 18612 plus sulphur, or 14714, or products like that that supply a nice bit of nitrogen, a nice bit of, um, of, of phosphorus and some sulfur for, for, uh, for grazing. So I'll, I'll just finish up on the last slide here, which is you know, part of the Grass 10 motto here as such, as of, of growing 14 tonnes of grass tomato per hectare, but in, particular, but in particular is achieving the 10 grazings in, in, in the season, which is what Grass 10 is about. And the first grazing rotation happens between sometime after turnout, you know, where, where, where it is maybe early, um, mid-February to mid-April. It might be a little bit later in some of the other parts of the country on heavier land, but that's our first grazing rotation. That only accounts for less than 10% of the grass going from the year. But from mid-April on, right, we still have nine grazing rotations left, and maybe in some parts of the country eight, but that's up for grabs. And I suppose the key point I want to raise, raise here really is, you know, between mid-April to mid-August. Mid there is, a, you know, that's a period of four months. It's uh, 120 uh, uh, days, 
right? And if we can achieve six grazings in that period, so six grazing rotations by 20 days each is 120 days. That's where the, the grass game is generally won and lost. There's obviously grass grown in, the, in you know, mid-August on and into mid-September, mid-September into mid-October, and you know, November can be bonus territory for many. But really, the grass production game is won and lost between the middle of April to the middle of August. And that's why I said at the start, just like, like you know, 80% of the grass is still to be grown from you know, the first week of May on. On heavier land, is 90%. So there's still a lot to play for here, right, in terms of grass production and getting our animals fed, and in particular, right, um, getting silage, you know, made to fill the empty cupboard that's there from um, the late spring of 2018, and I suppose to a lesser extent, you know, the early closing autumn of 2017. But if we can achieve these 10 grazings, and grazing roughly about 1,400 every time we go into, then we will grow our 14 tonnes. That's why grass 10 targets 10 grazings per paddock per year. But the secret is, between mid-April and, and, and mid-August is 120 days and to try to ch achieve five to six grazing rotations in that, in that point. You know, and this means that we have to enter you know, that uh, grass um, uh, cover of 13 or 1400 to graze the plant at the two and a half to three leaf phase. And the more grazing rotations we achieve, the more grass we will grow, which is the motto of grass 10. So, that's the end of my little uh, presentation here for a few minutes. So what's going to happen now is that uh, we will play the little video that we made at Eddie O'Donnell's farm, which was a, um, a walk that happened in the middle of April. Uh, Eddie was the grassland farmer of the year, 2017. And uh, we had an open day on that farm recently, and we're going to just give, it, give a, a short synopsis of uh, grazing management from that. And then, uh, we'd also r remind you to, uh, you know, post in your questions uh, while that video is running, and we'll 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 deal with those then. So, over to the video. It's the middle of, middle of April on Eddie O'Donnell's farm here, Grassland Farmer of the Year winner 2017. So, we're going to talk about grazing management. It's been a very difficult year in terms of growing and, and eating grass. So, at this stage, in the middle of April, we need to try and improve the grass supply on the farm and catch up on fertilizer because it has been late. Our first target is to get 100 units of nitrogen out uh, per acre by the 1st of May, and after that, to apply one unit of nitrogen per day in the rotation. We also need to be focused on um, getting some sulfur out. In this, on this farm, it's a case of CAN plus S right across April, May, June, and July. It would be also beneficial to try and get some phosphorus out onto the farm, simply because uh, phosphorus is required this time of year to grow grass, but it has been a difficult spring. The plant ha may have been damaged and is in the recovery and repair uh, phase, which phosphorus will help, and to a lesser extent, the decay. In terms of catching up then, and, and, and after, after uh, getting the grass to grow, right, we, we need to be focused on operating roughly at about a stocking rate of four cows per hectare. And we say that because a four cows per hectare growing um, um, 65 will roughly be a situation where the grass supply equals demand. The cow requires 16 kilograms of grass to matter per, per day, plus a small bit of meal with it for the cow mag purposes. And if, if we grow at, uh, at 64 a, 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 a day, that's equivalent to four cows per hectare. We need to operate though at, 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 um, at a rotation length of 18 to 20 days. We also need to be going into roughly 1,400 kilograms of dry matter per hectare, which is the right phase in terms of the two and a half to three leaf phase of the grass plant. If I operate at 20 days and grow 70 days, that's the 1,400, or 65 at 20 days is 1,300. The farm cover targets then are 160 to 180, right, per cow after doing the farm cover. On this farm, during the peak growth month, the, the farmers work twice per week, but on the overall year, 40 walks occur on this farm for the, for, the, for the grazing year. Finally then, just to be absolutely clear, one grazing rotation happens between, you know, early February and middle of April, right? And we're trying to achieve nine grazing rotations between um, the middle of April uh, to the end of the year. So basically, 90% of the grass grown for the year happens from mid-April on. In the period from mid-April to mid-August is 120 days, we need to achieve six rotations of 20 days each. That's our target, to achieve 10 grazing rotations per paddock per year.
Okay, John, uh, we're back online and we have a question in here from a Cormac Power. And he'd like to know that he's recently taken over a new reseed in tillage a number of years ago, which is now very hungry. What steps does he need to take to power it on? Is pig slurry and 3,000 gallons per acre be sufficient? Yeah, look, that's a common question for those who take over tillage land. Um, while this, the P and K status may not be bad, it, that, that land tends to be low in organic matter and the, the, the grass plant grows differently to uh, a tillage plant. So it, its demands are a little bit different. So it'll always look hungry, I suppose. We generally tell people who, who take over tillage land maybe to incorporate a bit of clover to help build the organic matter in the soil. But another way of getting organic matter back into that type of land is to uh, apply slurry. So if pig slurry could be got, that would be great. It would be a source of nitrogen. It would be a source of P. Um, okay, it would be a lower source of K, but that doesn't overly concern me as much. Um, it would also be a, a, a source of organic matter and a source of uh, sulfur. So to be honest, I need all those. I need um, some nitrogen, some P, some K, uh, definitely some sulfur. Uh, to have the organic matter process and slurry in itself supplies organic matter. So for those who are on tillage land converted to reseed, I, I, I would try and target as much slurry towards tillage land because it helps build the organic matter content and it also applies P's and K's uh, as well indirectly and, and nitrogen of course as well. But it's, it's, it's those other pieces of the sulfur and the organic matter are important. So um, if we can, to try and get some slurry onto that land at the start of the year, at the end of the year, um, maybe in the mid-season uh, as, as well, um, if, if at all possible. Obviously, with grazing, that's a little bit trickier, but we can go with lower volumes of more liquid material, which pig slurry is more friendly from a spreading perspective. So, yeah, tillage land needs, you know, a little bit more nutrients, and it needs certainly organic matter, and don't forget the sulfur. Yeah, so it's a good, good question, yes. Thanks, John. And we have another question here from Fergus. And he, like, do you expect grass growth to be down this year after such a challenging spring? And can slurry be spread on grazing ground? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, because if we look back actually to 2016, you know, it was a, a wet spring, growth was lower than normal. And people said to you, would suggest that we got off to a bad start and we went and grow as much grass. In actual fact, we ended up growing more grass in 2016 than we did in 2015. So, as I said in the presentation, you know, there's a lot of grass still to be grown. It's a difficult question to answer. We haven't got off to a great start, but the rest of the season goes well. We could still produce a nice bit of grass yet and maybe match, you know, the likes of 16, 17, in which we produce, um, you know, over 14 tonnes on average for those who measured on pasture based Ireland. But the evidence would suggest that there's a lot of the game still to play. And while we mightn't have a record year in terms of grass growth, we could still grow as much as we did in 16 and 17, which wasn't bad. And so, like, for those on heavy land, you know, it has been a late start. I accept that fully. But 90% of the grass grown will come from May on. So there's a lot of the game still to play for. So I'm optimistic. We need a good rest of the season. But... Um, while the start hasn't been good, we still might match as good as previous years. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, John. So oh, just, I... just on the, the sorry, the slurry on the grazing land. Yeah, if if the if the field is cut for bales, um, um, we can uh, apply slurry. I would say you know the more watery type. I would say um, you know a lower volume per acre, maybe thousand fifteen hundred gallons. So that can be done. If if the the field is well grazed out, we can, we can apply slurry. Again, lower volume um, and more watery slurry. So that, you know, you need a clean base of sward. Now, for the last two or three weeks, that hasn't happened. In many cases, sorry, in most cases, we can't graze to what we want to do. That means there's less grass, uh, sorry, that means there's more grass uh, left around, which is less desirable, which means you really couldn't apply slurry for the last number of weeks. But if, if we, if we, uh, cut paddocks off for bales, we have a clean sward, it's an opportunity to spread slurry, slurry. Um, and it's also an opportunity to spread lime for those who are behind on lime as well. Yeah, sorry Declan. Thanks John. So we've got a question here from uh, Brian Sunderland and he's asking what grass varieties would you recommend for new reseed on heavier clay soils and would you give recommendations for both grazing and silage? Yeah. 
Okay, it's a common question we get asked, um, and there's some new thinking on this on reseeding heavier soils. Right? I work in the Heavier Soils Programme, and we know we, we, we carried out drainage in farms, we had to reseed those paddocks that were drained because obviously they were um, you know, ripped up from the drainage process. We put in a mixture of um, what I would call a very dense diploid with a small amount of tetraploid, right? We're out, we're out into kind of grass varieties. Um, but the principle was to have a dense dip line to, 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 to have um, a good turf on the, on, or a good mat on the surface of the land. Now, the farmers in that program then will tell you that they find it harder for the cows to graze down well into that sward. And that's the problem with dense dip lines. While they do provide a good turf and do allow you to be a little bit more adventurous in terms of grazing and a little bit braver, to in the mid-season, they're harder to graze down. And for that reason, then, the farmers in that program have suggested us that we should go for, you know, diploids, but not as dense. So the, the Pasture Profit Index has a list of varieties there on it. There are some um, what I would call medium, dense, medium density diploid varieties there. Um, some of them come to mind are like the likes of, um, you know, uh, Drumbo, Aberchoise. There's a few others there as well, but they just come to mind very quickly, which are diploid varieties, very high quality. And I think that's the secret in this. The, that's what the farmers have come back to us and said that we want quality pastures. We, um, we want animals to graze them out well. We'll manage the grazing conditions, but supply us with, the, with, with high quality varieties. Because often on heavy land, grazing doesn't go according to plan. We arrive maybe later than we'd like, but we want the swar to hold us quality. So there's dense diploids uh, there on the list, but I suppose I probably prefer the medium density diploids that are on the pasture profit index that have figures for quality, you know, in the, in the 40s, 50s, 60s. You'll see that in the pasture profit index. Maybe to win some tetraploid with it, a small amount to, um, I, you know, to make the, the swar probably a, a bit sweeter for the, for the, for the animals to graze. Yeah, but probably um, avoiding the more denser diploids and go for the medium density uh, diploids yep. with high quality figures and pasture profit index. So another question, John, from William Keller. He has 50 units of area out presently. Land is still wet. He's asking, should he go ahead and spread 18612 or what should he do? What's your recommendation? Yeah, it's a very good question. We get asked this question a lot on the heavier land, and heavier land has a, you know, uh, unfortunately the soil stats tell us where, where P's and K's are, are lower. It's demand for phosphorus is higher. So I think William's question is very valid. I think his assessment is right. It has got some urea, that's the nitrogen supplied. I think then that we have to look at uh, applying 18612 when the conditions allow us to do that, and which we need that to happen on the heavier lands because of the way the spring has been so late, so wet, the autumn has been poor too, I th and, and chances are that land probably hasn't got slurry either. So as I said in the presentation, there's a big demand for phosphorus at the start of the season. Um, many of the heavier soils are, are deficient in phosphorus. So look, if with the weather improving towards you know, after the weekend we've had and conditions staying reasonable this week, hopefully that we can travel. I'd be recommending people on heavier land, especially on dairy farms, to apply two bags of 18612 plus sulfur per acre as soon as they possibly can to kick growth on and get the recovery process um, happening. Yeah. Um, thank you, John. We have another question here from Paul Morton, and he asks what your prediction is for the number of grazings for the northwest this year. He plans on finishing his first rotation this coming Thursday. Yeah, this is not an uncommon story. Um, some of the farms you have in the heavier soils program, be it beef or dairy, they're way behind on the first rotation. Um, a lot of them are still in it, and that, that's understandable. So look, is, is the grazing rotation going to be down a bit? Of course it is. Um, will we get 10? Not on those kind of farms, no. But if we get seven or eight, we would be happy. Obviously, you know, I would call um, November bonus territory. If we get into September, October, uh, and the conditions are reasonable, then we'll, we'll, we'll get close to seven or eight. But the, the thing is to get the show on the road now um, with the big improvement in temperatures and the weather at the weekend. Uh, you know, in many parts of the country, it was very, very good. So growth rate will ramp up dramatically now, and we try and target the 20-day rotation for the next, you know, three to four months, there thereabouts assuming the weather, weather remains reasonable, which means we'll get seven or eight grazing rotations. And we know we can grow 14 tonnes, even though we only achieve seven or eight uh, grazing rotations. So there's still a lot to be played for. And 
you know, you stick to the grazing management principles and keep the rotation length short and try to achieve as many rotations as we can. We mightn't achieve 10 on heavy land, which is perfectly understandable, but we can achieve seven or eight. Another question, let's say, is, John, let's say, you know, a lot of farmers have no silage reserves after the difficult yep. year that we've had. How can farmers take steps to build a silage reserve, reserve, beg your pardon, for this coming winter? Is surplus base the answer? No, it's only part of the solution. Um, this takes a bit of thinking now, and uh, like in many cases, the cupboard is bare and completely empty, right? And the first question you really have to ask yourself is, you know, and you have to think about this throughout the season. And, and as the season goes on, this question becomes more and more um, prominent and becomes more and more a priority, particularly around the September period. And the first question you ask yourself is, how much stock am I going to carry into next winter? And if there's surplus stock on that farm, whatever farm they are, whether they're, you know, a more saleable animal or they're surplus to your basic requirements of what you carry, irrespective of what enterprise you're in, should they be on your farm going into next winter? So that's the first question you ask. And if the season goes well, then, you know, we can, um, um, you know, ask that question and we might, we might be able to carry some surplus in uh, of stock. But if the season doesn't go as well, you have to ask that question very, very hard of yourself. So that's the first question. What animals will I carry into next winter? The next question then relates to what we just presented here, which is to grow as much grass as we possibly can, um, right? Which means, you know, being more aggressive in terms of grazing management, taking out paddocks that are surplus, obviously making a good first cut and second cut, assuming the weather conditions allow, use the slurry, use the fertilizer to do that, apply a little bit extra if we can, right? And to, to maximize those cuts, uh, which means then, you know, stock in the grazing area well. So we're getting off to a good start now uh, after the weekend because the weather has picked up, the sun is shining, soil temperatures are up, and, you know, um, uh, growth should pick up from now on. So uh, the other piece then that we have to ask is, is, is the question about, you know, it, like if we're continuously topping and wasting grass, yet we're short of silage, there's a question that we ask, am I wasting feed? And would it make more sense that I'm continuously topping to turn those paddocks or, or, or fields that have gone too strong on us into bales rather than coming out with the, with the mower or topper and cutting the stuff off and wasting it. So to me, there's probably uh, three or four steps in the process, just to summarize. One, that we, we um, uh, ask ourselves, you know, what stock are we going to carry into next winter? As the season goes on, then we know what silage we've made from first cut, what we've made from second cut, what we've made from surplus bales, and what some right, um, uh, in terms of the amount of feed I have versus the length of the winter and what animals we can carry, right? And if, 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 if you want to reserve, which I'd recommend people to try and do, right, then carrying less animals into winter is one part of generating that, that reserve. The next piece then is uh, getting the most from our silage cuts. The next piece then is, is trying to make surplus bales um, out of strong paddocks or fields to, have, to generate a bit of reserve. And, and the last piece is, if I'm continuously topping, am I wasting feed? And should that feed be in a bale rather than, than, than that rot into the, into the sward? John, another uh, query here from Gerald Slattery. And he's asking, let's say, should he stock higher now, you know, 4.5 plus livestock units per hectare uh, and feed more meal and take up more for silage? Yeah. So it's a very good question. A lot of the dairy farmers um, are looking at that. Um, so we know that the grazing conditions have been marginal for the last while. However, funnily enough, look at the growth rates um, on the normal type land, not the heavier land now, I've stressed that, right? Growth rates are normal. Um, so, you know, the figures I talked about is what we're roughly achieving. So the first thing to ask yourself is if, if I'm at four and a half cows per hectare, I, I, I you know, I have, I have a demand there, you know, close to the 70 mark. And if I can grow 70s, then that's achievable. If we go back to Eddie O'Donnell's um, uh, uh, day, you know, on the, the 19th of April, he was stocked at four cows per hectare and he was going to go to four and a half cows per hectare of growth allowed him. Now that has happened. So, you know, it takes a, a higher level of grass and management to, 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 to do that. It means, you know, being on the button in terms of the grass we go into every time. Once the surplus comes, you have to try and take it out immediately. It's not, a part, of, it's not part of the delay process because of that stocking rate, the circuit becomes faster and you, you have to have that grass coming back to you. So there's no delay in terms of taking out surpluses. Can it be done? Absolutely. 
but a uh, few things have to happen. You have to be on the ball in terms of uh, grazing. You have to keep the, the fertilizer out, and that's the nitrogen, it's the phosphorus, it's the sulfur story that has to be kept going. And you have to operate at, at, at that, those you know, 15, 16, 17, 18 days, maybe that time, 20-day rotation, right? But you need growth rates in excess of the 70s to match that stocking rate. Meal can help a bit in, in the pinches. I admit that, right? If we're only growing 65 and our demand is 72 at four cows per hectare, you know, or, or four and a half cows per hectare, and we feed two or three kilos of meal, that will get us at that pinch. I accept that fully, right? But if we're only going to grow 50s and trying to separate at 70s, to me, that, that doesn't make sense at all. You know, you're, you're, just, you're just trying to do too much. Either your farm is not up to it or the grazing management is not good enough or whatever, or the weather is against you. So um, I admit it, it can work, but it takes a higher level of grass and management and keeping the fertilizer out um, um, on a regular basis for that to happen. But for many, they can achieve it quite easily, yeah. Just finally, that uh, one question I'd like to ask you, John, as I say, when is the best time for farmers to read this year, reseed this year, and when is the best time to spread lime? Okay, two good questions. We'll start with the reading, reseeding question first. Look, all the work that's been carried out in terms of research practices um, and practices of reseeding and all and timing, um, you know, would, would tell us that, you know, late April, early May is a good time to recede. Now, the year hasn't lent itself to that, right? Um, the reason we, we target reseeding in the first half of the year more than the latter half of the year is that we have a high growth rate, right, which um, allows us to maybe stock the farm a little bit heavier and allows us then to reseed this field. The other thing then, the recovery of the reseeded sward is fast, so the turnaround time is, is way faster. And we, we, we believe, looking at, looking at the success of reseeds, you know, having a nice sward established, free of weeds and things like that, you know, um, it, it's, e it's easier to achieve a better reseed by reseeding in the April-May period than it is in the August period or later. Often, planning of reseeding in August can go late or slip into September. Then there's challenges around grazing, there's challenges around establishment of clover, there's challenges around weed control. Because you're coming into a more marginal time of the year, conditions are often poor for grazing, for spraying as well, to get control of docks and chickweed. So while we are running behind in terms of the season, um, for people who want to go reseed now, which there's been a lot of queries about that, and so it's a good question to ask, it's not too late. Uh, get the show on the road and get this done. Now, as you move more into June and July, you're into lower rainfall um, uh, territory normally, and when you're in the lower rainfall territory, right, the, the, the problem being is that the establishment of the sward is, is a little bit more riskier, unless, of course, you're on heavier land, and they often do that in Ju June, July, and get away with it quite easily because of the nature of the land. So if you are to go do the reseed process, I would probably pick a technique that allows me to get this job done fast, take advantage of rainfall in May, so that the sward is well established going into June, and we'll be grazing sometime in June. So that's the reseeding, the reseeding piece, Declan. Yes, it's uh, possible, but it's, it's, you know, time is moving on, so we need to get, get this started. Right, lime. Yeah, often lime is applied at the end of the year. To me, that's what I would call a hope strategy. It's um, hope I get the weather to spread it. Hope the contractor will come the day I want him. Um, hope the lime is in the yard the day I, I need it, and hope I won't damage the fields in the process. There is too much hope on that for many many farms um, trying to apply lime to build soil fertility, which is the first step um, of fixing the nutrient status of the soil. So that's that's important to note that. So, on, again, as I mentioned earlier, I work in the Heavy Soils program, and the lads in that program trying to apply lime in October, November, December has been uh, too difficult to achieve it with, uh, consistently with success for many of them. So what they're doing, they're taking a different approach. So instead of blanking the farm with two tonnes of lime per acre, they go by a field-by-field field approach or a paddock, by a paddock approach. So assuming the growth rate picks up again um, uh, in May, Right, surplus grass will become available. That gets taken off for bales. You now have a clean sward. Right, that's an ideal opportunity to apply lime. Now, you know you might be applying. You might be applying. You might have five acres out. So you get your. You need a contractor to, to, to be flexible here. But many of them are now. In fairness to them, they've adjusted this quite well. In which they'll to bring in a, a ten-ton spreader or something like that. Apply two tons an acre to five acres. So you're picking off parks as you go. We have um, the second cut area. That's another area that will have a lovely clean sward, right? 
and again, you might have 30 acres and you're going to get your lime applied there. So it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of a case of picking off your areas, so your silage area is an area you can pick off. Paddocks made, for in, you know, made into bales, they're a lovely clean sward. Get the lime on and uh, um, you know, your half ton, or your ton and a half, two ton per acre, um, uh, and pick a paddock or a field as you go. Um, but the contractor will, will, you know, will do that for you, rather than trying to wait to the back end and hoping for everything to happen and going well in terms of weather, which often it doesn't. So field by field, paddock by paddock, take advantage of the silage area as well to apply line. Thank you, John, for that very com comprehensive overview of Problem. grazing management, particularly this time of the year. Uh, thank you to our viewers for, for posting questions. If there's any further questions, please do post them, and, and John will ask to them uh, after we, we, we go off air. So, John, maybe just to finish, just your three top key messages uh, to finish on for grazing management in the months ahead. Yeah, just in pure simplicity, to try and keep the rotation into around 20 days. Right. Okay. That's the way the grass plant grows. A leaf appears every seven days. Once the, you know, we want the three leaf stage, the two and a half leaf stage. Once the fourth leaf appears, we have more stem and we have more dead material, which is not good for animal performance. So that's the first message. 20 day rotation. Second message is to apply a compound fertilizer that has um, some phosphorus, um, uh, some K and sulfur with the nitrogen. So 18, 6, 12 plus S, 14, 7, 14 plus S, products like that, that uh, give us a kick in terms of, in terms of um, nitrogen P's, K's and sulfur. Now we've, we've, we've got conscious regulation as well and you know everybody who's, who's in a derogation will, will know the limits in terms of phosphorus and what they can apply in the farm, but phosphorus should be targeted at the front end. We've been running behind in terms of story, running behind in terms of fertilizer, now it's time to catch up. And I suppose the last point is in terms of slurry, Tanks have been, have been uh, full across the spring. It has been a late spring. Animals have been housed longer. So there's a chance to get that slurry out on the first cut area and a chance to get the slurry out in the second cut area. But particularly the first cut area, because um, tanks are full, we don't want to bring a slurry into the back end. It's too risky in terms of application and, and, in, and in terms of grazing. Now is the time at, you know, at silage time, the end of May, early June, to try and get you know, slurry out onto that area. So. So, John, it, we actually have one more question. Yeah, we'll take up. it. Yeah, we'll take it. Uh, and this is from McNolan. And his question right. is, have Chagas reviewed their silage estimations due to such varying length of our winters? Many who budget to get out early February have been stung badly this year. Yeah, this comes, it's a good question. This comes back to the point about the reserve, um, um, uh, Declan, the question you asked earlier. And like, you know, we've come from an era of being in quotas for, you know, 30, 40 years, there, thereabouts, I suppose, right, for many. And, you know, um, now the herd has grown, and, and, and I think you're right in your question, it's mostly dairy farmers that probably got uh, a bit burnt in terms of soil supply. So they've been carrying more animals, um, maybe some surplus replacements, maybe even some surplus cattle in some sort of situations which I've seen, right? And expecting the farm then to carry all this, right? So this is part of the Grass 10 campaign. This is part of our response to it because the department and other stakeholders said we have to grow more grass, we're going to carry more animals. So this is why we're trying to grow more grass. So everybody needs to take a, a, take a review of where they are in terms of what animals are going to carry into the winter, how much of a reserve they want. We've had difficult years in 9, 12, you know, now, um, you know, the spring of 2013, the spring of 2018, there's messages in there that have been forgotten, all right? Now, we've gone from a period of being, um, you know, in quotas to out of quotas, and people haven't reacted to, 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 to the, the feed supply on the farm. And that's why we're trying to grow more grass on the farm through the Grass 10 program. In the heavy soils program, I'll, I'll go there because it's the most extreme, we asked those farmers, who, uh, and most of them are dairy farmers, to carry 10 tonne of silage. That's what they have to try and do for the year ahead uh, per, per cow or per livestock unit. Because of the length of the winter, to have a reserve at the front end and, 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 and at the back end, and then to have a reserve as well during the main grazing season. Because you can run into a week or two in which are bad, right? So that's what we've asked of them, right? Sometimes you'll get a bad back end and a reasonable front end. Sometimes you get a, a poor front end and a good back end. The reserve then deals with those where you get a good back end, where you get a bad back end and a bad front end. We just need a little bit extra to play. This is why we talk about, you know, 
you know, not wasting grass on the farm. This is why just question marks about topping and wasting grass. This is why we focus on grazing and making the surplus paddocks into bales. Okay, so that's, uh, I suppose, uh, to wrap up at this stage, to thank all those for their questions this morning. I hope people got a few um, in, uh, pointers and indicators to try and get the most from, um, from grass this year. It has been a late start. All I keep reminding you is that for many farms, uh, you know, uh, three quarters of the grass to be grown is still to play for, on heavier farms is even more than that. Just keep the principles there and try and generate um, extra grass grown so we can finish to fill that and finish the season well and fill that empty cupboard that's there. Best luck in terms of grazing. Thank you.